The Collected Works of Lev Vygotsky, Volume 2, Fundamentals of Defectology. This is the introduction called Vygotsky in Soviet Russian Defectology. It is written by Jane E. Knox and Carol Stevens. Lev Semenovich Vygotsky, who lived from 1896 to 1934, is known to the English-speaking world as a psycholinguist, a theorist, and a founder of Soviet cognitive developmental psychology. What may be less familiar is his key role in establishing the discipline of a normal child psychology in the USSR. The American editor and translators hope that the availability of this volume in English will serve to make this additional facet of Vygotsky's work more widely known. His text appeared in Russian in 1983 under the title, The Fundamentals of Defectology. The word defectology, which may sound harsh to Western ears, is the current Soviet term for the discipline which studies the handicapped, their development, teacher training, and methods. It was apparently introduced into the Russian language in 1912 as a term borrowed from contemporary German curative pedagogy. In Russia, the field underwent dramatic transformation in the decades following the revolution, but its name remained unchanged. In fact, one of Vygotsky's contributions to the discipline was to help provide a strong theoretical basis for continuing to treat the psychology and teaching of the handicapped as a single unified field. This present volume, which appears as volume five of Vygotsky's collected works in Russian, contains a selection of essays, speeches, reports, comments, and reviews assembled and edited by members of the Scientific Research Institute of Defectology at the Soviet Academy of Pedagogical Sciences in Moscow. The relationship of Vygotsky's activities to the current Soviet discipline and its preeminent research institution, the Institute of Defectology, is a topic that will be discussed in greater detail below. With a few exceptions, the compilers of the 1983 volume chose to include in it works which Vygotsky wrote between 1924 and 1931. <clears throat> Although most of them appeared in the contemporary Soviet press, a few essays, among them The Blind Child, Difficult Children, and Moral Insanity, are printed here for the first time. The period 1924 to 1931 marked Vygotsky's rise to national eminence, both as a brilliant and creative psychologist and as a defectologist in the new Soviet Russia, and the consolidation of his influence. It may also simply have encompassed his most prolific years, but Vygotsky's star did not remain at such heights in the Soviet academic firmament Following a period of criticism and rejection beginning in the 1930s, Vygotsky's legacy in the Soviet Academy has been controversial and his contribution to the discipline hotly disputed. The controversy over Vygotsky is deeply rooted not only in the theories he propounded, but also in the historical context from which those theories emerged. We should like to discuss briefly here each of these issues in an effort to elucidate Vygotsky's ideas and clarify the nature of the contemporary debate about him. <clears throat> One, Vygotsky's studies of handicapped children and their psychological development emerged as part of a burgeoning interest in special education following the Russian Revolution. Neither special education nor the study of the handicapped had been prominent in Imperial Russia. World War I, the revolution, the subsequent civil war, famine, and uneven recovery, despite the administrative, social, and economic upheaval they brought, were accompanied by an intense intellectual ferment that helped alter that situation. A number of pre-revolutionary defectologists founded revolutionized schools, clinics, and teaching institutes to study the handicapped. The result was a proliferation of institutions affiliated with the new Commissariat of Enlightenment Education, which were part of the, the Soviet government's efforts to, de to democratize, educate, and politicize Russian society. 
However, these more numerous institutions remained under the leadership of pre-war defectologists, whose politics and academic perspectives could hardly be described as committedly Marxist. By 1921, a new social problem had focused particular attention on special education and led to the creation of an entirely different set of institutions for special education. A tragic product of the years of war, revolution, civil strife, and famine was the creation of an army of homeless, orphaned, vagrant, abandoned, and neglected children, about 7 million of them by 1921 to 22. Officially, the educational system took responsibility for these homeless and abandoned children. The task of housing and educating them was in itself a mammoth one. To add to the difficulties, a number of these children had special problems ranging from physical disabilities to recidivist criminal behavior. Both the scope of this problem and the general social conditions prevailing in Russia in the early 1920s made it impossible to devote exclusive attention or significant financial resources to the needs of this population. Nevertheless, concern for these abandoned children did lead to the inauguration of a special section of the Commissariat of Enlightenment called SPAWN, social and legal protection of minors. Beginning in 1923, that is, after the 1921-22 famine had reached its peak, more of the new institutions sponsored by Spawn were directed toward identifying, housing, and educating children who were physically handicapped or, dis or difficult to educate. The net result of the general focus on education and the particular concern for abandoned children was a marked increase in facilities for studying and teaching the handicapped and training teachers for them. Even these new facilities, however, were often dominated by pre-war specialists whose training and perspectives were not Marxist. This was the field of defectology in which Vygotsky made his mark in the mid-1920s. Not only did his career reflect the new opportunities in the field, his writings also broached the particular problems of the Russian Republic of that time. For example, the chapter in this volume entitled Moral Insanity is a particularly direct analysis of psychological traits encountered among abandoned children. This chapter and others like it document Vygotsky's personal involvement with Spawn. It would be a mistake, however, to attribute Vygotsky's influence in defectology from 1924 to 1931 solely to the independent activities of a brilliant and committed young researcher in an expanding field. Contributing to Vygotsky's emergence were attempts by the new Bolshevik government and by individual scholars to encourage or generate Marxist schools of thought in a number of academic disciplines. Indeed, Vygotsky's activities and influence in this period seem almost to epitomize the unprecedented opportunities the revolution could provide for young Marxist scholars. Even before the revolutionary change of power in 1917, there can be little doubt that Vygotsky was committed to a radical political perspective. Born into a Jewish family in Belarusia, Russia, Belarusia, now Belarus, in 1896, his early life was unavoidably cir cir circumscribed by the restrictions the Russian Empire imposed on its Jewish subjects. His own abilities and his family's relative prosperity helped him partially to overcome these. He was privately educated, graduated a gold medalist from a Jewish gymnasium, and entered Moscow University in 1914 under the Tsar's quota system which limited Jews to 3% of that prestigious institution's student body. Vygotsky's radical political and intellectual inclinations were evident even at this age. While pursuing his studies at Moscow University, for example, he also attended Shinyavsky University. Shinyavsky was an unofficial establishment founded by those expelled from Moscow University for anti-Tsarist activities in 1911. From its inception, its faculty and student body included many who would become prominent academics in the early Soviet period. In 
Vygotsky could receive no degree there, but he undertook broadly interdisciplinary studies in psychology, history, and philosophy. These studies proved to be his enduring interests and eventually the focus of his professional career. Meanwhile, his formal education at Moscow University culminated in a law degree in 1917. Ironically, in the Russian Empire, this choice of profession would have permitted him to reside beyond the geographic boundaries of the Pale. Otherwise, like most other Jews in the empire, he could have legally resided only in the Western lands. However, as Vygotsky graduated, the Romanov Tsars were overthrown and such restrictions were lifted. Within months of his graduation, the October Revolution brought a new Soviet government to power. After graduation, he apparently abandoned his interest in law and returned to his hometown of Gomo, which was within the Pale. There, in the years following the revolution, he taught literature and psychology. At a local teacher's training college, he established a psychology laboratory for the study of the handicapped. Since Gomo harbored one of Belarus's two homes for mentally retarded children, one might speculate that Vygotsky's interests in the psychology and education of the handicapped developed here, but there is no direct evidence of this. Vygotsky first appeared on the national siege in 1924, after Soviet Russia had survived its first traumatic years. The homeless and abandoned children were already a major social concern. Spawn had been founded. In January 1924, he delivered a lecture in Leningrad at the Second All-Russian Psychoneurological Congress. His report proved an impressive challenge to reflexology, the, de the then dominant perspective in psychology. Vygotsky's views attracted the attention of N.K. Kornilov and A.B. Zalkind, among others. They were seeking to create in Russia a significant Marxist school of analysis in psychology and educational psychology. Vygotsky's training and early activities might have been attractive to them. His attack on reflexology and his style of analysis certainly were. He was invited to return to Moscow State University, as his alma mater was now called, and join the Institute of Psychology. As N.K. Kornilov had recently been made director of this pre-war research institution, it was rapidly becoming a prominent center for Marxist psychology. Vygotsky's connection with the Institute where he compelled his dissertation in 19 or completed his dissertation in 1925 provided him with a base within the National Academy and ultimately with colleagues supporters and disciples in the study of the handicapped as in psychology marxist perspectives were not prominent before the mid 1920s vygotsky quickly emerged as an important contributor in both fields he was not only a critic of older perspectives and methods, but also an original thinker and researcher. Briefly, what he proposed was a new eclectic Marxist view, which emphasized cultural rather than hereditary influences on development, and which drew heavily on his own reading in Western psychology. Vygotsky's first appearance, or first appearances as a defectologist in the capital were important occasions for the discussion of these views. One such occasion was the second All-Russian Congress for the Social and Legal Protection of Minors, SPAWN. The Congress marked a sharp break in the study of the handicapped in Russia. The Congress's closing resolutions condemned older methods, castigated them for their impotence in dealing with abandoned children, and set education for the handicapped on a new path. Vygotsky's two reports to the Congress, elaborations of which appear here, as chapters one and two of part one, bolstered and supported the Spawn recommendations. Vygotsky insisted particularly that special schools should share with the general education system the social goals set by the Soviet state, productive labor, labor and self-sufficiency. Vygotsky's influence as both researcher and proponent of the new perspective expanded rapidly after the second Spawn Congress. This influence is readily visible in the growing list of his institutional affiliations. It was not uncommon for academics in the 1920s to hold 
a number of posts simultaneously, and Vygotsky was no exception. In 1925 to 1926, he began organizing a laboratory for the study of abnormal children at a medical pedagogical station in Moscow. Vygotsky's patron, Kornilov, had been affiliated since its foundation with Moscow State University II, an institution known as the Red University in the late 1920s because of its many Marxist and pro-Soviet scholars. When the university organized scientific research institutes at its pedagogical faculty in 1926 to 1927, Vygotsky was named associate director of the defectology section. His ascendancy in studies of the handicapped became even more marked with the onset of the Cultural Revolution in 1928. His was the lead article in a lengthy segment on institutions for children differing from the norm in the major three-volume pedagogical encyclopedia. His research and activities had <clears throat> his research and activities at the Moscow State University II Institute also prospered as he joined the editorial board of the Defectology section's new journal, Questions of Defectology, in 1929. Such benefits to Vygotsky did not proceed without cost to scholars of the old school, however. In this, as in many fields, the Cultural Revolution beginning in 1928 intensified the challenge of militant communists against established pre-war intellectuals. The medical pedagogical station to which Vygotsky's laboratory was attached in 1925 to 1926 was a case in point. It had evolved from a private pre-revolutionary school sanitarium into a, com a, a complex of revolutionized schools, clinics, and laboratories under the direction of its founder. There was even a pedagogical institute for special education at the same address after 1920. The entire complex served as a model experimental institution for the Soviet educational system after 1923. The Pedagogical Institute was closed in the wake of the Second Spahn Congress, however, since it had espoused the old methods. Although the station as a whole continued to be praised for its research into teaching methods and retained the classification Model Experimental until at least 1929, the institution underwent severe re restructuring in the late 1920s. Its leadership was censured for failing to conform to the com Commissariat of Enlightenment's new position on special education, and the station was described as overemphasizing biological factors in evaluating the handicapped. This stock phrase used to identify the old defectology distinguish it clearly from the socio-cultural emphasis espoused by Vygotsky and others of the new schools. Perhaps in connection with this restructuring, Vygotsky's lab gained titular independence in 1929 as the Experimental Defectological Institute, hereafter EDI. The particular focus of its research became oligophrenia. But 1929 and 1930 proved to be the zenith of Vygotsky's influence. The Cultural Revolution ended, paradoxically, in 1931 to 1932 with an abrupt turn to greater party discipline and a more nar narrowly defined orthodoxy. Not a few of the party's erstwhile allies in academic institutions and the new perspectives and experimentation they had encouraged found themselves at intellectual and political odds with a new direction. The retrenchment which followed helped complete the consolidation of Stalinism in many intellectual educational institutions. Under its impact, some parts of the educational system were reorganized. Many Soviet universities were divided into smaller, more specialized units. These smaller units were intended to provide more directly for the technical and practical needs of the first economic plans. At the same time, however, the reorganizations housed unruly militants in smaller, more easily disciplined units. These and other changes at the close of the Cultural Revolution profoundly altered the disciplines of psychology, pe pedology, educational psychology, pedagogy, and defectology.
The place of special schooling changed as the Commissariat of Enlightenment felt the impact of events in the early 1930s. Many of Spahn's independent uh, facilities were subsumed under the general education system after 1930, the date by which Spahn had hoped to eradicate the problem of abandoned children. The, institu the institutions with which Vygotsky was associated suffered among others. In 1931, another decree emphasized that special schooling was but a part of the broad mass education system. The decree guaranteed education to all, including the handicapped. At first glance, however, the newly streamlined system was ill-equipped to fulfill that promise in special schooling. In a parallel fashion, defectology research felt the blast of the Communist Party's reproaches. Research institutions were closed and reorganized. Marxist and non-Marxist psychologists alike, the party argued, had not contributed constructively to the building of socialism. Furthermore, some Marxist psychologists were moving in directions that directly contradicted the practical goals of the next five-year plan. Under attack in the early 1930s, differences of opinion within Marxist psychology deepened. Zalkind and Kornilov's early collaboration broke down. The unanimity of Marxist psychologists at the 1928 Ped Pedagogical Congress turned into acrimonious confrontations about the profession's allegiance to the party. For the next five years, condemnations, many of them against erstwhile allies, grew both from the party and those psychologists who chose to ally themselves with, the view, with its views. In 1936, after Vygotsky himself had been dead for two years, the attacks culminated in a decree exc excoriating educational psychology in particular. Those studying the handicapped and those selecting students for special schools were especially singled out for criticism. The decree referred obliquely to earlier accusations against defectologists. They were too eclectic. That is, they borrowed foreign theoretical perspectives and tried to pass them off as Marxist psych psychology. And they were too idealistic. That is, their theories were too far separated from practical requirements. The focus of the decree, however, was the fatalism attributed to educational psychologists. Such specialists blamed a child's shortcomings either on heredity or on social environment. The decree argued, this position failed to take into account the remedial effects of institutions and individuals. Thus, educational testing and the psychologists who designed it were discovering problems where none existed. As a result, the special schools were being flooded with children who would respond better to normal schooling. No wonder the care in such schools was inadequate. The Commissariat of Enlightenment was ordered to transfer these students back to normal schools forthwith. The combined long-term effects of these conditions was first to weaken Vygotsky's influence, even in those institutions where it was strongest. Moscow State University, too, was one of the educational institutions reorganized in 1930. The Lenin Pedagogical Institute, one of its successor institutions, lacked the former in university's resources, although the new institute retained a defectology section. That section emphasized practical teacher training rather than a broader research-oriented approach. The research journal Questions of Defectology ceased publication in 1931. The ordained emphasis on activism also affected the Experimental Defecto Defectological Institute, the EDI, where Vygotsky was replaced as director in 1930 by Israel Izykovich Danyashevsky, <laughs> a man from the teaching side of the profession. Danyashevsky had once been associate director of the Children's Special Commission of the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic. He had also acted as associate director of the now dissolving Spawn section. Despite his replacement as director, Vygotsky's research at EDI continued, almost until his premature death in 1934 of tuberculosis. One of his last publications was co-authored with Danyashevsky, 
and appeared under the imp impromptu of the Institute, by then named in honor of M.S. Epstein, Associate Commissar of Enlightenment. Vygotsky also retained his supporters in the Institute of Psychology, although the Institute's influence was much diminished. A few months prior to his death, a study group there undertook to edit two of his major works. The 1936 decree against educational psychology nearly eliminated whatever influence remained to these institutions and to Vygotsky's ideas. Vygotsky's EDI under Danyushevsky was reorganized in 1936 under the name Scientific Practical Institute of Special Schools and Children's Homes, a title it retained until 1944. The Institute of Psychology, many of whose members had resigned under party attacks since 1930, took the full brunt of party outrage. There were more resignations and some arrests. At least two of the leading lights of Vygotsky's time were shot, disappeared, or were sent to labor camps. By transferring individuals and favoring other institutions, the party deliberately moved the focus of teaching and research in child development psychology to Leningrad. Vygotsky, who had been the object of overt and deliberate attack before the 1936 decree, was no longer cited even by his closest remaining friends and disciples in the purged disi disciplines. They did, however, make use of some of his ideas. What really caused such an abrupt rejection of Vygotsky's ideas and influence? How much of his work survives in the contemporary Soviet discipline and institutions of defectology? It is tempting simply to conclude that Vygotsky was a random casualty of high Stalinism. That is, since Vygotsky and his ideas did not correspond well to the party condemnations of psychology and defectology between 1930 and 1936, it is not clear why he in particular should have suffered. Accusations against his eclecticism and idealism are barely distinguishable from similar attacks on other intellectuals, as the party tried to establish, establish cultural orthodoxy in the early 1930s. Recent historical work offers less random explanations for cultural and institutional changes under Stalin in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Governmental and party pressure were not the only factors involved. Among academic disciplines, for example, the tempo and character of the move toward an orthodoxy acceptable to the party varied considerably. In some areas, the new orthodoxy was, dis was established quite early and after an abrupt break. This was true of history and architecture, for example. Major changes in a few fields were less dramatic or even delayed. V. I. Vernadsky, for example, retained his commanding institutional and intellectual position in the earth sciences surprisingly unchallenged until his death, despite being openly critical of Marxism. The nature of disputes within a given dis discipline among academics themselves provides one explanation for such differences. Early and abrupt changes happened where there were attacks from some members of a profession against others, often more established or powerful. These attacks received first tacit and then increasingly active party support until an orthodoxy was achieved which conformed to party goals. In the absence of internal disagreement, change was slower, less abrupt. Thus, the party's treatment of a profession or discipline in the 1930s may have been related to the internal cohesion of that profession, as well as to the party's goals. The presence of a generally accepted scientific paradigm in a field would be a particular in inducement to such cohesion. Perhaps there are lessons to be learned here with respect to Vygotsky's treatment in the 1930s and the transmission of his ideas to the current Soviet discipline. Psychology and defectology apparently corresponded to neither extreme case described above. In any case, it is difficult to draw conclusions about the structure of these two disciplines as studies of the institutional and professional relationships among psychologists in this period are still few in number.
However, despite these differences among themselves, it is clear that Soviet psychologists were quite slow to accept party leadership in the early 1930s. Only after at least four years of increasing pressure did Pavlov and others finally agree to support a new perspective that was acceptable to the party, Marxist Pavlovianism. Meanwhile, men like Danyushevsky, Vygotsky's institutional, if not intellectual heir, protected some of their colleagues through the worst of the purges. Other researchers and practitioners fled into medical institutions or worked outside the major cities. Indeed, in the 1940s, the institutions and even some of the individuals Vygotsky had known in the 1920s formed a nucleus for the Defectology and Psychology Institutes at the Soviet Academy of Pedagogical Sciences. With others in the profession, A.N. Diakov, a graduate of Moscow University, II's defectology section, helped to reorganize Vygotsky's old laboratory to form the Institute of Defectology in 1943. It was, after all, the oldest facility for the study of the handicapped in the country. In 1944, the Institute's first formal director was L. V. Zankov, who had worked at the laboratory since Vygotsky's time. The Institute of Psychology, refurbished by the very same N. K. Kornilov after 1938, was transferred away from Moscow University one at the end of the war. Like the Defectology Institute, it became part of the psychology section of the Academy of Pedagogical Sciences. Vygotsky's colleagues and students, A. R. Luria and A. N. Leontev, were elected to the Academy within a few years of its foundation. The foregoing over oversimplifies, however, the origins of the current Soviet Institute of Defectology. In fact, of course, its first members came from a variety of universities, research and pedagogical institutes, and they thus constituted an institutional and intellectual heritage more mixed, less Vygotskyan. Nonetheless, despite current debates over Vygotsky's ideas and the stigma and controversy surrounding those who suffered from the purges, the current preeminent Soviet institutions for the study of abnormal child psychology bear both the institutional and the intellectual legacy of the turbulent 1920s. 2. The text, Fundamentals of Defectology, is a selection of materials written at the peak of Vygotsky's productivity and influence. It consists primarily of theoretical and critical discussions and de-emphasizes the experimental aspects of studying handicapped children. This theoretical emphasis reflects, in part, the dynamic and innovative, innovative changes taking place in the 1920s at all levels of intellectual, scientific, political, and artistic life. As described in the preceding section, the years between 1924 and 1931 saw a reassessment of traditional views in many areas of scientific scholarship and the creation of new revolutionary theories in the spirit of Marxist dialectics. Fundamentals of Defectology constitutes Vygotsky's attempt to create a new understanding of the psychology of abnormal children and a new methodology for the development of residual strengths and other intact healthy functions. Vygotsky's work Vygotsky's work with abnormal children was conducted concurrently with research on fundamental issues relating to the language development and psychology of all children and served as a basis for solving these larger problems. In short, these papers and the ideas reflected in them represent a major contribution to the formation of modern Soviet develop developmental psychology. As one might expect from his personal role in creating a Marxist school of psychology, Vygotsky addressed here what he saw as the crisis in that field. On the one hand, Vygotsky takes a critical stand toward the existing Western schools of psychology, behaviorism, individual psychology, etc. On the other hand, these theories served as a point of departure for his own inquiry. The form Vygotsky used to elaborate his fundamental theories is that of critical dialogue with his contemporaries and predecessors. This approach reflects a popular concept of dia 
dialogism, an approach based on communication shared by leading linguists, literary critics, and Mar Marxist theor theoreticians of the 1920s, such as V. N. Voloshin, M. Bakhtin, L. P. Yakubinsky. Accordingly, all verbal thought, i.e. internalized speech, represents a dialogic interaction with the exterior social-cultural world, which, in varying degrees, is perceived, reflected upon, and responded to. Vygotsky developed his position by first stating the psychological theses of others, then criticizing them, and finally adapting or revising these views to incorporate his new perspective of cultural historicism. This dialogic method corresponds to the very core of Vygotsky's theory about psychological development and is most succinctly expressed by the statement from The Genesis of Higher Mental Functions, so often quoted by Vygotsky scholars. Any function in the child's cultural development appears twice, or on two planes. First it appears on the social plane, and then on the psychological plane. First it appears between people as an interpsychological category, and then within the child as an intrapsychological category. The internalization of interpsychological cultural or historical processes is very much a major issue in Vygotsky's extremely interesting essay in part three of this book, The Collective as a Factor in the Development of the Abnormal Child. Here, nearly the same statement is made, but now in reference to children with psychological and physical handicaps. Moreover, what is true for any child appears also to be true for this adult scientific researcher. Vygotsky's tendency toward dia dialogism both in his own thinking as well as in his theories about child psychology approaches the Hegelian Marxist formula, thesis, antithesis, and, th and synthesis. Wirch characterizes Vygotsky's style of inquiry in the following way. It is important to note that Vygotsky's account of mind was a mixture of existing psychological theories and Marxist ideas, and that in the end, there may be less Marxism than he would have liked. However, this outcome in no way diminishes the importance of Vygotsky. This cosmopolitan cross-referencing to Western scholarship lost its attraction to most Soviet academics in the late 1920s. Indeed, this mode of writing served as the basis of accusations of co cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism leveled against numerous academics in the 1930s and 1940s. Vygotsky and his colleagues among them. In fact, although Vygotsky was credited in the 1920s with constructing a new psychology based on Marxism, his preferents are eclectic and not always Marxist. Indeed, he referred to foreign authors without offering ideological evaluations of them. Many scholars have pointed out that Vygotsky's approach to psychology was above all methodological. Vygotsky's methodology implied Vygotsky, the theoretician of psychology and metapsychology. As Wirch put it, in the opinion of some of today's leading Soviet spokesmen in the field, V. V. Davidov and L. A. Radzikovsky, <laughs> holy shit, Radzikovsky, many of Vygotsky's most insightful and lasting contributions come from his work in, in this category. From Vygotsky's earliest writing, he claimed that his intention was to bring forth a methodological, that is, metapsychological analysis of the crisis in psychology. His position was that of a theoretician who assesses the crisis from the outside, rather than that of a professional psychologist tied to some partisan point of view. In trying to establish a scientific psychology, Vygotsky believed it necessary to interrelate psychological scholarship and concrete practical reality. In this respect, he bridged two camps in psychology. The cognitive-oriented German school, mainly Adler's individual psychology, idealism, etc., and the behaviorist-oriented American school. While not accepting the idea that psychological development comes solely from within the individual's psyche, he also rejected the notion that the human mind is tabula rasa, 
a clean slate which simply absorbs patterns of behavior from a particular environment or from the behavior of nurturing adults. Vygotsky's theories, as we shall see below, combine the two approaches. The same can be said of his approach to the psychological study of handicapped children. Here, Vygotsky elaborated new methods which he believed were theoretically valid and appropriate for the transformation of traditional approaches, for the creation of new and necessary means of working with these children. It was the particular or individual concrete facts of a handicapped child's life, the environment, the social conditions surrounding such a child, his potential and his limitations, that Vygotsky examines as the basis for a new scientific understanding of abnormal development. Many of the understand or many of the fundamental laws explored in Vygotsky's better known works receive attention and unique application here. For Vygotsky, the fundamental laws governing the cognitive and psychological development of an abnormal child are identical to those laws which guide the development of normal children. These laws, summed up as follows, must serve as the basis for the pedagogical and training program of any child. One, there are two lines of development, the natural, physiological, or biological, and the historical, cultural. The cultural historical line is internalized through the use of psychological tools, the most important of which is language. This line of development is superimposed on and radically transforms natural behavior. The latter is not replaced by the former, but is sublated, embedded in the structure of the personality as a whole. Two, interfunctional dynamics is, is at all times present in human development. Therefore, neither intelligence nor personality can be reduced to a quantitative listing of various individual functions. Vygotsky's use of dialectical materialism, Marxist methodology, as a scientific basis for the new psychology led him to emphasize the whole person, the whole mind. This approach was not unique to Vygotsky. Bakhtin, for example, wrote that although dialectical materialism does indeed require that the whole personality be studied and provides the methodological foundations for such a study, the idea of the whole person is certainly not exclusive to Marxism. We know that the idea of the whole personality was the culmination point of romantic idealism, of Schelling's philosophy of unity, of the teaching of Fichte in monadology of Leibniz. Three, the interaction and association among the various higher and lower functions play a paramount role, particularly when one biological function fails. In the case of such a failure, the second line of development, with the help of numerous sociocultural tools, can enlist other biological functions to circumvent the weak point and build a psychological, mental superstructure over it. In this way, a bypass is created so that a defect does not result in an overall defective or abnormal personality. For example, although a blind child is physically limited, his or her remaining functions work together to overcome this impediment, processing stimuli from the outer world with the help of special means such as Braille. At any given moment, a child is full of unrealized potentials, and these offer a wealth of creative resources on which a handicapped child, or any child, may and must build. Such is the enriched, holistic psychology of human nature which Vygotsky bequeathed to us and which demands further attention by Western psychologists, linguists, and pedagogues. In this volume on the development of abnormal children, Vygotsky focused on the, on the last of these three fundamental laws. He devoted particular attention to the cultural or historical line of development, which he believes had previously been underestimated or neglected. We read in Vygotsky's introduction to this volume, the history of cultural development in a handicapped child constitutes the most profound and critical problem in modern defectology. It opens up a completely new line of development in scientific research. Later on, Vygotsky stated that the development of the remaining intact healthy senses is not enough. This disregards the, fear, the sphere of social pedagogy 
What is needed is the development of certain more complicated, integral, active, and effective forms of child experience. In Vygotsky's view, development of the higher mental functions stem, stems not from natural inner sources alone, but from interaction with the object-oriented and sociocultural world of the child. In place of biological compensation, the idea of social compensation must be advanced. The mind, particularly reason, is the function of social life. Hence, a child who comes from a socially or culturally deprived environment may not be exposed to those more complicated forms of experience of which Vygotsky spoke. As a result, this child may be diagnosed as mentally retarded or as a difficult to handle child. Mentally handicapped or as a difficult to handle child. As Vygotsky pointed out in several sections, particularly in the chapter devoted to difficult children, the natural abilities of these children may be intact, but their higher mental functions have not been developed. This circumstance may lead society to judge them as handicapped, primitive, and even, in extreme cases, morally insane. Their environment has not subjected them to intense acculturation, communication, or the appropriate nurturing. As a result, their development has been stimmied. As an example of such psychologically primitive behavior, Vygotsky refers repeatedly to the case of a young uh, Tatar girl who, sp who spoke Tatar and Russian simultaneously. She was first diagnosed as psychologically abnormal. Then A.E. Petrova, a Soviet psychologist and educator who was conducting studies on child primitivism, demonstrated that this case of primitiv primitivism was in fact conditioned by a lack of command of either language, Russian or Tatar. Thus, the little girl's mental activity diminished in those situations which demanded verbalization. Similarly, Vygotsky would argue a child with a biological defect, such as a hearing loss, may not have been adequately stimulated by alternative channels or paths of development. Therefore, society may believe such a, child's, a child is mentally handicapped or inferior when, by means of creative alternative paths of development, he can reach a superior level of development through overcompensation. The critical reader might well ask, can such a child in fact become superior in his development? Vygotsky ar argues both here and elsewhere that he can. The world pours through a large funnel, as it were, and thousands of stimuli, drives, and callings. Inside from the narrow end as response reactions of the organism in greatly reduced quantity. The actualized behavior is but an infinitesimal part of the possible behavior. Man is full of unrealized opportunities at any given moment. These unrealized opportunities for behavior, the disparity between the broad and narrow ends of the funnel, is an indisputable reality, just as real as the reactions which have prevailed. Precisely because a defect impedes development, a handicapped child can be stimulated with the help of a talented, skilled teacher to develop strengths which might otherwise be unrealized. In this way, the child overcomes or rises above his or her primary deficiency. As an example of overcompensation or superior development, Vygotsky cited the case of Helen Keller, who responded to the demands of her tutor by using all her, her capabilities to reach the upper level of her development. Vygotsky wrote that in Helen Keller's case, her defect did not only not become a break, but was transformed into a drive which ensured her development. Vygotsky. Vygotsky, therefore, criticized those developmental psychologists and educators who are chiefly concerned with counting and tabulating a child's weaknesses, particularly when they use those measurements of weaknesses as the sole basis for placing the child in an educational program, Bennett and Simon, for example. In fact, he argued, one must test for a child's strengths and talents and these are different for every child. Vygotsky strongly rejected an arithmetic approach in favor of a more qualitative evaluation, which assesses the whole personality. As L. Brown and Roberta A. Ferrara pointed out, 
For Vygotsky, static IQ measures do not provide direct information concerning the optimal level of performance of which the testee is capable, an optimal level that is of considerable interest for those who wish to design instruction. Such intelligence tests measure only the level of learning already acquired, rather than providing a gauge of the potential for improvement. They are good predictive for poor diagnostic tools. Oh, hold on. They are good predictive but poor diagnostic tools. Therefore, the main aim of diagnostic testing should be an assessment of what a child can do under the proper educational circumstances, rather than a tabulation of what he or she has learned to that point. Vygotsky subsequently outlined three basic issues which the scientific researcher must examine in his study of the cultural development of a handicapped child. The degree of primitivism in the childhood must, or the childhood mind, the nature of his adoption of cultural and psychological tools, and the means by which he makes use of his psychological functions. The last third issue is closely connected with the concept of mediation which plays a very important role in Vygotsky's theory, and which is often referred to by Western scholars as the theory of second-level signals. In order that the child mediate, make sense of, and interact in a meaningful way with the environment, he or she must have access to and acquire a multitude of psychological tools or artificial historically developed cultural signs available to shape and organize the world. Because most psychological tools are designed for the normal person with all senses and mental functions theoretically intact, special psychological tools must be developed for the abnormal child, which focus on his or her other healthy functions and residual strengths. For example, the handicapped child may acquire braille, finger spelling, lip reading, or hand signs, all of which represent symbolic systems which have been culturally and historically developed in response to his or her unique way of processing the world. This diversity of tools constitutes an important issue not only for Soviet defectology, but for all of developmental psychology. Every and any child must be able to obtain ready-made those tools historically formed by many generations. As the English psychologist Paul Arnold writes, it was important for Vygotsky that each child does not have to reinvent his or her own mind every generation. A child can therefore potentially obtain the most modern ideas and ways of thinking. For Vygotsky, linguistic tools, whatever form they may take, determine development. Language, together with activity, leads the child's development. As noted already, Vygotsky was stating that humans master themselves from the outside through symbolic cultural systems. What needs to be stressed here is his position that it is not the tools or signs in and of themselves which are important for thought development, but the meaning encoded in them. Theoretically then, the type of symbolic system should not matter as long as meaning is retained. All systems, braille for the blind and for the deaf, dactyl dactyl dactylology, or finger spelling, mimicry or a natural gesticulated sign language are tools embedded in action and give rise to meaning as such. They allow a child to internalize language and develop those higher mental functions for which language serves as the basis. In actuality, qualitatively different mediational means may result in qualitatively different forms of higher mental functioning. Although there is no way to rank these as some kind of genetic hierarchy, one could make the argument that different mediational means are associated with different intrapsychological outcomes. Each handicapped child is different because the psychological tools on which he or she relies are different. Handicapped children are then, as Vygotsky points out, psychologically different from normal children and from each other. Such a formulation might suggest a new approach to the, to the controversies over sign language in Western deaf education. Vygotsky, however, repeated here as elsewhere that although the means of development may be different, the fundamental laws of development are the same for both normal and abnormal children, and that the educational content must be the same for both. 
In the case of a handicapped child, the entire difference lies in the fact that one organ of perception takes over for another, while the quantitative content of the reaction remains the same. In this light, Vygotsky reintroduces a Pavlovian notion stating that, from the point of view of physiology, any educational process may be seen as a process of developing conditional reflexes in response to certain signs and signals. The human being may then be trained to respond to any external stimuli which impinge upon the eye, ear, skin, and so forth. In Vygotsky's words, the unique uniqueness of this type of education for the handicapped children simply boils down to the substitution of one path of training for another. Whereas traditional pedagogical methods have previously proceeded from a purely quantitative conception of childhood development, Vygotsky proposed a new fundamental thesis, the defense of which is the sole justification for the existence of defectology as a science. A child whose development is impeded by a defect is not simply a child less developed than his peers. Rather, he is developed differently. A child in each stage of his development, in each of his phases, represents a qualitative uniqueness, i.e. a specific organic and psychological structure in precisely the same way a handicapped child represents a qualitatively different, unique type of development. Given this unique character of handicapped development, Vygotsky called for a careful re-examination of the relationship between the defect and the compensation. Modern defectology, Vygotsky felt, must proceed from the position that, although a physical or mental defect may cause limitations and obstacles to a child's development, it also stimulates compens compensatory processes, as in the case of Helen Keller's cited above. As a result, the personality of such a child becomes something different than simply the sum of underdeveloped functions and properties. In his introductory section, Vygotsky re-examines the views of various German developmental psychologists, such as W. Stern, T. Lips, A. Adler, and others, on the relationship between deficiency and compensation. For example, W. Stern's theory of the dual role played by a defect was particularly meaningful to Vygotsky. In Stern's words, thanks to organic unity in the case of failure of one faculty, another faculty undertakes the accomplishment of the task. Then Vygotsky referred to a law of mental life established by T. Lips, the law of psychological damming up. Energy is concentrated at the point of weakness where a delay in development has occurred. However, this energy may then overcome the weakness by proceeding by roundabout ways, and in place of delayed de development, new processes are generated due to the blockage. These roundabout ways and new processes become the focal point of Vygotsky's theor theorization. It was A. Adler, however, with whom Vygotsky seemed to find the most in common. Particularly important was Adler's view of the creative character of development complicated by defect. The positive uniqueness of a handicapped child lies in the new formations created by the lapse, a uniqueness not found in a normal child. Summarizing this position, Vygotsky wrote, whatever the anticipated outcome, always and in all circumstances, development complicated by a defect represents a creative, physical and psychological process. The creation and recreation of a child's personality based upon the restructuring of all the adaptive functions and upon the formation of new processes, overarching, substituting, equalizing, generated by the handicap and creating new roundabout paths for development. Vygotsky qualified Adler's position with his own view that compens compensatory processes do not always occur successfully. Two results are always possible failure or success. This outcome depends on many factors, but, of all, but above all on the reserves or strengths of the child and the successful interaction with the social milieu. For Vygotsky, the effect of the defect on the child's personality and psychological makeup is secondary because the children do not directly sense their handicappedness. The primary cause for this special kind of development is the limited restrictions put on the child by society. 
it is the socio-psychological realization of the child's strengths which decides the fate of personality, not the defect itself. Precisely at this point in Vygotsky's theory, his concept zone of proximal development, a concept he finally developed in the 1930s, was foreshadowed. Although he did not use this now well-known term anywhere in Fundamentals of Defectology, its origins are implicit here. As in his other works, Vygotsky insisted that the contemporary educator must, must look not only at the plateau or delay in development, but at overall potential. To educate a child as blind or deaf means only nurturing that child's blindness and deafness, and not the development of the whole personality. Modern defectology must liberate the special school from any trace of phil philanthropic, invalid oriented or religious atmosphere based on an interaction of pity and charity. Instead, it must develop special pedagogical techniques aimed at the positive uniqueness of these children in order to create in them the necessary socio-cultural superstructure which will shore up development at its point of physical or mental weakness. Thus, it is the second line of development which best serves the development of the higher mental processes, and it requires a special pedagogue to interact with this child and develop in him or her these roundabout paths of development. According to Vygotsky, only a scientific knowledge can create a real pedagogue in this area. In Essays of Part 2, Vygotsky focused on pedagogical specialists and the techniques needed when dealing with various handicapping conditions – blindness, deafness, moral insanity, primitiveness, developmental retardation, and unmanageability. In all cases, Vygotsky insisted that the same standards of education be used for the handicapped child as for the normal child. He advocated, however, new schools which would incorporate the skills of the particular symbolic system needed to compensate the deficiency, be it braille or some alternate means of mediation and communication. The blind or deaf child will need the use of a different symbolic system maintaining the identical content for any instructional or educational process. In this book, considerable attention is devoted to deafness for the reason that Vygotsky saw deafness as one of the most critical defects, more critical, for instance, than blindness. In his view, humans are first and foremost social beings and need to communicate with one another. The primary focus of deaf education must, therefore, be on the return of speech through the use of a systematic input of all the senses kinesthetic, auditory, visual, and tactile. Vygotsky feared that sign language alone would close the deaf child off in a very narrow and confining world with only those who know the primitive language. Later on, he gave up the notion that sign language was a primitive language, as we shall see below. While affirming the necessity of speech instruction, Vygotsky at the same time recognized the cruelty and inhumanity of many of the existing methods for teaching speech. He considered the classical German phonetic methods for teaching speech to be antithetical to a deaf person's nature because they were based on a dead, meaningless repetition of sounds. Such an approach emphasized classes and drilling rules or articulation, not on functional, live, meaningful speech. Speech was not introduced as a psychological tool to be used in interaction with others or to shape one's personal experience. Speech for all children, however, depends on communication, not on the repetition of phonetic exercises. Vygotsky supported the method proposed by the Danish educator G. Forshammer, who developed the manual oral system. This system involved the coupling of the mouth and hand movement as the deaf mute child pronounced words, because this integrated multisensory approach to speech incorporated several channels of sensory input, tapping the wealth of the overall nervous system. Vygotsky was also very much interested in a report at the June 1925 All-German Congress on the Education of the Deaf about the new method proposed originally by the Austrian specialist in deaf education, K. Malish. Malish proposed that children be taught words and whole phrases which they can use for communication in their surrounding milieu. The limitation of this method was that Malish did not reject the phonetic method, 
According to Vygotsky, a teacher at the Moscow Institute for the Deaf-Mute, I. Golosov was the first Russian to make an original attempt to teach oral speech by means of entire words, approaching the natural flow of real language. This was the direction in which speech instruction must proceed. The solution, according to Vygotsky, is to revolutionize methods of teaching speech and return to a deaf child the live language with the child ne which the child needs and can use in daily life. Only when speech merges with the deaf child's overall behavior and experience will it become an essential and permanent ingredient in this psychological development. While promoting the special programs, Vygotsky recognized the dilemma which the special school has posed in the past and will continue to pose. It breaks off contact with the normal world and isolates the handicapped children, putting them in a narrow, closed off world where everything is calculated and adapted to the defect, where everything reminds the child of the defect. Vygotsky wrote that in the past and particularly in Germany, special schools had created an artificial milieu which was psychologically unhealthy for children because such children already cut off to a certain degree by their handicaps needs closer contact and deeper roots in life. Such is the task of the modern special school which must merge more closely with public education. In order to overcome this dilemma, Vygotsky proposed that the fundamental principle of the education for handicapped children be active participation in collective life based on meaningful labor and vocational training. This was a principle being broadly advocated in the Soviet educational system at the time. Work-oriented education offers the best path for entrance into life. A children's collective is an essential factor because it builds up cooperative responsible behavior and self-organization. Vygotsky devoted an entire section in part three, the collective as a factor in the development of the abnormal child to this problem. A child develops in co-relationships with his peers. Even a young child at play develops techniques for submitting to the rules of the collective. In this section, Vygotsky stressed the point that, in place of the phil philanthropic atmosphere of an artificial hospital-like invalid-oriented alms house, i.e. the old school, the new school must foster living skills, social behavior, initiative, leadership, and collective responsibility. To support his view, Vygotsky cited the position of Nadezhda K. Krupskaya, um, Vladimir Lenin's wife, and an advocate of similar educational forms in the entire Soviet system, namely, the position that a new polytechnical labor-oriented education was necessary for all children. Like others in the 1920s, Vygotsky sought to create the new Soviet man. In the new society, the very concept of defective defectiveness must become archaic and all citizens must have a productive role based on their strengths. This was a matter not only of educational education of the handicapped child but of re-education of the public. With respect to mental handicappedness, Vygotsky divided children into two groups, physically, biologically retarded and socially retarded. Most cases, in his view, belong to the second category. Such children are mentally handicapped and underdeveloped because of difficult or adverse conditions in their lives and at school. In these cases, if circumstances are changed, many a formerly, formerly uneducable or unmanageable child may start to thrive, exhibiting an unrecognizable giftedness. As previously stated, these materials also specifically addressed pressing social problems in the Soviet Union of the late 1920s and early 1930s. Vygotsky, however, did devote an entire essay to the first category, the physically or mentally ch um, handicapped child. <clears throat> As Vygotsky stated in earlier essays, the compensation compensatory process cannot be understood merely as a process of substitution of one physiological function for another. In agreeing with W. Wundt, Vygotsky stated that this process must be understood as a complex restructuring of all psychological activity. 
In compensatory processes in the development of the retarded child, Hegel's concept of off-ben is explored with respect to, to mental retardation. During the compensatory process, a primary loss most apparent in the early stages of development is gradually diminished in importance by newly occurring formations acquired through more mature sociocultural development. In other words, this primary defect is not omitted, but buried or embedded in the overall superstructure created by the second line of development. The child's personality develops in response to the difficulties encountered, and he or she must find roundabout ways to overcome the deficiency. The major goal in the study of mental handicappedness is, according to Vygotsky, the creation of a positive differential approach, that is, the identification and classification of children according to their various individual talents and potentials. The wealth of each handicapped child's reserves and strengths must be the, de de the determining factor in establishing a program for him or her. If the educational program aims only at the primary debility, then little progress will be made because this deficiency submits only indirectly and with great difficulty to pedagogical influence. However, the reverse may be true of other physiological and psychological functions, such as motor development and practical common sense versus abstract or logical thinking which can respond to direct influence and compensate the primary weakness. One of the most curious passages of Fundamentals of Defectology is the section entitled Moral Insanity in Part 2, a manuscript, manuscript from Vygotsky's personal archive and published here for the first time. This expression for mental illness or insanity was borrowed from English terminology and originally represented the extreme view of this condition as an organic illness. Vygotsky, however, re-examined mental illness as a type of moral deficiency or amoral behavior, caused primarily not by an innate organic defect, but by deficient, amoral, or impoverished socioeconomic, cultural, and pedagog pedagogical conditions in which the child grew up and developed. Vygotsky wrote, the problem of moral insanity is posed and solved in our country as a problem of environment. The solution offered here is to normalize the environment and to provide different conditions, more auspicious for child development. Here again, education must play a large role. Vygotsky, along with other Soviet psychologists and pedagogues of this period, were responding to the large number of juvenile delinquents child prostitutes and other homeless neglected children who roamed the cities and the countryside during the turbulent years of the Civil War and the Great Famines. For Vygotsky and his colleagues, it often turned out that they were dealing with children who possessed a heightened sensitivity and that this observed sensitivity had been nothing more than a defensive reaction, a self-defense, a biological defensive armor against the diseased influences of the environment. Vygotsky did not deny that there may be psychopathological factors behind mental illness, but he played down their significance. Like other physical and mental handicaps, this weakness or deficiency may be overcome by developing the whole personality, by building up the second line of cultural development so that the organic impairment diminishes in overall significance. For him, psychopathy was a major factor in mental or moral illness only for a negligible number of children. For whatever reason, Vygotsky did not concern himself with it, with it in these essays. Three, Vygotsky's contribution to the field of normal and abnormal child psychology is not limited to the 1920s and 1930s. Many Soviet psychologists today credit his theories and he is more highly regarded in some institutes than in others, but at least lip service is paid to his contribution. Moreover, among Western scholars, there has been a recent upsurge in interest in Vygotsky's ideas. According to James Wirch, Vygotsky has something to say to American psychologists, whose stumbling block is too often reductionism. That is, they have too often isolated and studied phenomena in such a way that they cannot communicate with one another, 
let alone members of other disciplines. Vygotsky's approach to child development restores an integral, holistic picture of human nature, bringing together various fields such as linguistics, sociology, psychology, physio physiology, and pedagogy. More significantly, Vygotsky offers us a method which allows the experimenter or educator to see the underlying developing psychological processes. This method speaks to another stumbling block in American education. American educators traditionally reach down to help the child at the level he or she has already achieved, whereas the Vig Vygotskyan School of Educators and Psychologists set up an experimental situation, which, as Arnold points out, artificially provokes or creates a process of psychological development. Such a method intentionally provokes or disrupts behavior so that the child will be drawn forward to new levels of behavior. For example, in the section entitled Defectology in the Studies of the Development and Education of Abnormal Children, Vygotsky promoted the indirect structure of development whereby a child's spontaneous direct attempt to complete a task is cut off and the child is faced with demands for adjustment which exceed his capabilities when he cannot cope with the task by means of a natural reaction. Whenever the circumstances demand more than a primitive reaction, complex, complex cultural operations begin in a child, such as the case when a child can no longer give a direct answer to a problem in arith arithmetic. He or she then turns to using the fingers, which once only part of the background, now take on the significance of simple operational tools. <clears throat> in contrast to some of J. Piaget's experiments with young children, Vygotsky wrote, we organize a child's performance in such a way that he encounters difficulties. The result is that the child begins to plan operations by reasoning them out with the help of egocentric speech. Obstacles stimulate compensatory development. Vygotsky here gave the example of a child with a drawing task which, which demands a red pencil. The pencil has been removed and the child began to talk about what he must do to improvise in this situation. Vygotsky argued that if all were made easy for the child, he would then have no need to reason out loud. Such experiments are important for very young children, language-delayed children, and, and mentally handicapped children. Because for all three groups, speech turns out to be a tool for reasoning. In all three cases, speech, like the fingers in an arithmetic task, can become the organizing tool to help the child plan his or her way around the difficulty. Vygotsky forces today's psychologists to re-examine the question of how to break out of biology's hold on psychology and to move into the area of higher mental operations based on cultural tools. In the Soviet Union, Vygotsky's experiments were continually elaborated at the Institute of Defectology, Academy of Pedagogical Sciences, in order. One, to study the inner mechanisms of language development and two, to intervene positively in abnormal, delayed language development. In the West, Vygotsky's method is most widely known as the realization of a child's zone of proximal development, or ZBT, or ZOPED. <clears throat> Contemporary Western scholars interpret this approach to mean that adults or competent peers will bring a child forward from what they can already do themselves at a primitive level of operations to reach a higher, more complex level. That is, they will help the child acquire the tools needed for this higher level of psychological activity, so to enable independent action in the performance of the aimed for activity. In Vygotsky and the Education of the Deaf Child, Paul Arnold addressed the importance of special education, which requires teachers to understand both the child's potential and limitations and to teach to the higher level of ability. Incorporating Vygotsky's notion of zone of proximal development, Arnold wrote, Jeff, deaf children develop more slowly than hearing children, and this suggests that their zones of potential, develop, potential development are wider. They need more teaching to develop. <clears throat> 
we may have too low expectations of hearing impaired children because their present level is more apparent than their potential, and their potential must be forced on by teaching. The concept of the ZPD has become the focus of considerable research activity in the United States and England, as well as in the Soviet Union. Much attention is being turned to the role played by adults, teachers, and more competent peers in fostering child development. This concept is now even being incorporated into studies of children working at the computer. Here, the computer, one, sets up a zone of proximal development for the child as it automatically responds to his or her individual strengths and weaknesses, and two, supplies a wonderful medium for child computer teacher or peer computer peer interaction. Many of the resulting publications stress the Vygotskyan notion that real learning and development occur in a communicative setting that is among people and not as isolated individual acts. While such ideas speak to educators and developmental psychologists concerned with any children, Vygotsky's views of the role of the collective in the development of speech and language have particular rele relevance for today's specialists and educators of handicapped children. In principle, Vygotsky's book addresses today's problem of mainstreaming, his view that handicapped children must not be socially cut off or outcast from the mainstream of society, but must be accepted as full productive members of society, speaks to the question of mainstreaming. As J. Tudge correctly pointed out, Vygotsky held that if blind, deaf, or mentally retarded children were educated separately from normal children, they would proceed in a totally different and not beneficial manner. Vygotsky argued that this would lead to the creation of a special breed of people. Here, in fact, Vygotsky's hypothesis is absolutely contradictory to the present situation in special education in the Soviet Union. For the most part, handicapped children learn in special schools and few studies have been made of this effect on their overall psychological development as a special breed of people. Although Vygotsky often stated that it is necessary to erase borderlines between the special school for the blind or other handicapped children and public school, he never insisted that the handicapped attend the same school with normal children. Instead, he insisted on the concept of differentiation, on special alternative means of communication and development, and on a specially manipulated environment which would supply those psychological tools most suitable for the particular child's abilities. If handicapped children need more teaching, specially auxiliary means, special teachers, and a differentiated education at every stage of their development, how can this happen in a mainstreamed classroom with normal children whose development proceeds in other ways? This is a question which Soviet educators and diag diagnosticians raise today when asked about mainstreaming. This question may be complemented with another. If the child needs a special educational environment, isn't it better economically and psychologically to provide it in a special school? The Vygotskyan tradition has its own controversies with respect to the education of the deaf. One of them concerns the place of sign language and the rehabilitation of the deaf child. Members of the Laboratory of Adult Education of the Institute of Defectology, who have been conducting psycholinguistic studies on the structure of sign language and its role in education of the deaf, are quick to point out and applaud the gradual change in Vygotsky's attitude towards sign language. In this collection of articles, as will be explained below, Vygotsky shifted from an initial rejection of sign languages to an eventual exception, or acceptance of it as a useful auxiliary tool for development. Vygotsky felt that deafness was a far greater handicap than blindness because it deprived children of what they need most to interact with most other children, spoken language. Originally, Vygotsky rejected what was called mimicry as a viable means of instruction and communication, apparently because he first perceived gesticulated language as a natural lower elementary function rather than as a higher cultural or mental function. Throughout this volume of essays, a notable evolution of Vygotsky's views on mimicry, sign language of the deaf, occurs. In an early essay, he stated that mimicry, the natural sign language of the deaf, 
could not serve as an instrument of abstract, logical thought. In his later speeches and essays, however, Vygotsky reformulated his position on mimicry, concluding that the full development of a deaf child dictates an expansion of the system of verbal means used in the educational process. One must reevaluate the traditional theoretical and practical attitude toward the various individual forms of speech used by the deaf mute and above all toward mimicry. Recognition of sign language as a valid auxiliary communicative system allowed Vygotsky at later stages of his activity to determine the uniqueness of a deaf child's education as a development under conditions of polyglossia. He considered the acquisition of different forms of language by all possible means to be the most productive path of development and growth. And he wrote, the maximal use of all forms of speech available to a deaf child is the necessary condition for radical improvement in his or her education. It is this later view of his sign language as an auxiliary means of language acquisition, which corresponds with today's educational approach to deaf children and as such serves as the grounds for ongoing research in the Institute of Defectology. Some Soviet Vygotsky followers, like Alexander Mitcheryakov, placed greater emphasis on physical, material tools in the real three-dimensional world. These tools for Mitcheryakov were especially important for the development of blind, deaf children, for whom tactile input becomes a major source of information and means of interaction with the surrounding world. By placing a tool in the hands of a blind deaf child, the educator turns the child's imp impetuous actions into a meaningful manipulation of his or her environment, into socially organized, goal-oriented activity. The connection between manual and cognitive activity, so important for a blind deaf child, is reinforced and expanded with the help of these tools. What is in the hands becomes what is in the mind. The principle of psychological tools became the underpinning of education at the famous deaf-blind school in Zarkovsk, north of Moscow, where the children were, and still are today, immersed in a world of object-oriented activities such as farming, animal husbandry, sculpturing, clay modeling, and building. In his book about the school, Awakening to Life, Mitcheryakov emphasized the Vygotskyan notion that object-oriented activity develops the higher mental functions in deaf-blind children. Such forms of activity as modeling and building exercises, which by their very nature are designed to promote a child's sensor, sensory motor development, can and must be organized in such a way that they promote the child's discovery and knowledge of objects and help them to form generalized images which reflect the phenomena of real life correctly and in depth. All in all, although Vygotsky remains a controversial figure in many psychological and pedagogical circles in the Soviet Union today, he is given enormous credit. This credit is nowhere as clearly voiced as in the afterword to this volume. Here, the well-known members of the Institute of Defectology uh, E.S. Bain, T.A. Vlasova, R.E. Levina, N.G. Merzova, and Z.H.I. Schiff wrote that Vygotsky made a most important contribution to the creation of a scientific basis for so Soviet defectology. His experimental and theoretical research in the field of abnormal children remains fundamental to productive work on defectological problems. Vygotsky's work helped to restructure practices in the field of special education. In the overall picture of psychological development, Vygotsky's contribution to the study of children is by no means limited to abnormal children. Many American scholars today share Vygotsky's view that a careful scientific study of abnormal children allows us to observe an exaggerated slow motion form processes which are well known as pertaining to all children. These processes are more difficult to observe in normal children because they occur at a more accelerated pace. For this reason, Vygotsky's work on abnormal children should have a broad base of appeal to American readers.